Uh, I want to welcome you all back to the uh, day two of Revolve CC. Um, this will be our first of our keynotes for the day. Um, I wanted to uh, welcome Hunter Foster. He is uh, a Tony-nominated uh, actor and director. Uh, he's currently directing Elf at the Forrest Robert Theaters, which opens uh, December 4th. anything that w that inspired me the way that performing did and it, even at such a young age and I just kept wanting to do it and became like a drug so I, I just kept auditioning for local stuff and doing stuff in my high school and and then uh, you know then it, the inevitable question comes are you going to do this for a living and then um, you know I, I had the chance to you know I took a couple years off when I got out of high school and my parents moved to Detroit and I knew that the, the, oh, there's, there it is. Hello, hello, how are you? Um, and then I went to, my parents went, went to li were living in Detroit at the time, and I knew that the University of Michigan had this new musical theater program. It was brand new at the time, and so I, I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna do this for a living. So I, uh, my parents were like, what? <laughs> are you crazy? So I ended up going to the uh, University of Michigan, and, um, and then I just kept going from there. I just, I never, I kept waiting for, you know, something to tell me not to do it, but my heart kept telling me that I wanted to be in the theater. So, it, so it really just kind of just kept growing and growing and growing. You never had that ah oh, moment or anything. Well, like I mean, so, you. Well, I mean, yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> I mean, come on, it's the entertainment business. I mean, you know, I, uh, it, it, even last year during the pandemic, it's like, okay, that's it. Theater's over. I'm never going to work again. Never going to have. So, you know, you as as an artist, I don't think that ever goes away. That. Uh, you're, you're never going to work. Uh, no one's ever going to want you. I mean, that 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 always eats at you. No matter how successful you get, it's always there. Yeah, we had the talk, talk earlier uh, um, about uh, imposter syndrome. Yeah, Hannah, who's oh, in there. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Hannah. Absolutely, yeah. imposter syndrome. It, it, yeah, Bob Fosse, who's been um, to his dying day, thought that he was a fraud, which I think is, you know, it's so crazy. He's one of the greatest choreographers in Broadway, Broadway history. So. I mean, there's shows named after him. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that should be a sign. Exactly. Um, so um, we'll talk. We'll go into a little bit of your uh, your history here. So um, one of the things that I found researching you is one of your earliest big roles uh, was as Bobby Strong in *You're in Town*. And for those who aren't familiar, can you give them a rundown of what that is, what that play is about, the satirical nature of it, and and what was it like to be in that production? Sure. Um, *You're in Town* opened. Um, we opened off Broadway. It was. I'll, I'll never forget my. Uh, if, if you don't know it, it's not your in town, Y-O-U-R-I in town. It is your in town, as in P. And um, it's about uh, an apocalyptic world in which uh, water, we're running out of water. 
um, which in climate change, who knows? That could, that, that, you know, some, and, I, and these, the guys who wrote it were thinking of climate change and thinking about um, the potential for some uh, catastrophes such as that where the water is running out and so they have to ration, um, you have to pay to pee, basically, because of, uh, they're trying to limit water intake. So you have to, uh, I forget how much it was, but you have to pay, pay to pee. And if you, if you um, do something wrong in, in the society, you're taken to a place called Urine Town, and basically that is being thrown off the top of a building. Um, and I was sort of the hero, I and mean, it's actually very funny. I know it sounds sort of dark, but um, and it was it was a, a satire of musical the, of musical theater, basically. Before all the other shows um, started um, doing stuff like that and making fun of um, musicals, it was the first one. And some of the di I mean, that direct address to the audience sometimes. Uh, I mean, like you know, sometimes in a musical, this is what happens, and sometimes in a musical. So it's in it, and we you know we ripped off. Uh, talking about Chicago and West Side Story. And so it was, it was this sort of weird comedy. And I remember getting the script for it. My agent's like, you can't do this. You can't do this. And I had been in uh, you know, four or five Broadway shows by that point. He's like, you can't do this. And I thought, well, you know, why not? Let's do it. And so we did it at this little tiny theater on 54th Street. Uh, it was above a police station. So I literally would walk into the theater behind guys in handcuffs and you'd walk past holding rooms where they had men in orange jumpsuits. So it was, a, so it was doing theater um, in this tiny little space above a police station. And then it just caught fire. And um, people really loved it. And they uh, decided to move it to Broadway, which who couldn't believe that we were going to move to Broadway. And uh, we won best book, best music, best director. We didn't win best musical that year. Um, but the thing about Urinetown was that we opened on um, September 20th, 2001. So we, we were supposed to open on September 13th, 2001. And 9-11 uh, uh, obviously happened on, uh, on that Tuesday. We were supposed to open on Thursday. And so we were the first show to open after 9-11 in New York. And uh, I was just talking about this today, some of the students. You know, we, we canceled the the 11th and the 12th, and then we were back uh, on stage on the 13th, two days after the attack. So that was, Urinetown will always be sort of um, attached to 9-11 because it was the first Broadway show to open after. And if you go back and read the reviews, uh, they, they, they talk about a quarter about the show and about 75% of how they felt about 9-11. So it was a very, very scary time to be in New York and, and be on stage because, you know, they had to do checks coming in the theater because there was um, rumors that they were that uh, uh, Al Qaeda was going to blow up a Broadway show, and I mean it was very, very, very scary time. Oh yeah, I, I missed being there by about three weeks. I was tried my hand at New York right out of college, and I was left in like late July. So yeah. I, I have very vivid memories of that era too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was great. I mean, we went on. It, when we, you know, we recovered pretty quickly, and, and the show had a really successful run for about two years, and it was, yeah, it was sort of the highlight of my career. Oh, I think that's, you've got plenty of other highlights on here. I've got a whole sheet of them. No. <laughs> so, um, the, um, so uh, one of the ones that I noticed is, like, you have, tend to have a tendency to have a lot of movies, uh, or a lot of uh, plays that have been adapted from movies. And one of the ones that I saw you had, like, sort of the, one of the earlier ones that I saw that you had done was Summer 42, which, for those of you who don't know, is like a, was like a seven, 1970s coming-of-age film. Um, and what, what made you interesting translating that into a musical? It was kind of a somber movie, if I recall. Yeah, I mean, I always want to, um, my dream, even before becoming an actress, I wanted to be a writer. And um, so I was able, in my career, I've been able to write six musicals that, that have all been produced, and three of them have been, have been two have been published. And so I'm, I was, this was the first one that, that I wanted to, to uh, tackle because it was a film that, I don't know, it was a coming of age story. I don't know if anyone knows the, the movie. It's set during World War II, and this, this young boy who's 16 sort of befriends this beautiful war bride whose husband's gone off to war, and then um, he, she gets, at the end of the film, she finds out that her husband has died, and um, she needs, uh, he comes over and, and finds her, and she's been drinking, and she has a, he finds the telegram saying her husband's, in, uh, and he spends the night with her to comfort her. And, um, and he's in love, he's been in love with her the whole film, and it was just such a, a I don't know, it's a heartbreaking film, and something that I really, really loved as a kid, and so when I thought about writing a, a, a musical, that was the sort of my, the first, 
thought, thing I thought of, and I teamed up with David Kirschenbaum, who's a who also went to University of Michigan, and we we spent several years writing it. And funnily enough, funnily enough, is funnily a word? Um, it opened the same year as Urinetown, so it actually opened in December of 2001. So both those things happened at the same time. We, of course, didn't run very long because of um, uh, we were downtown and no one was going downtown at that time. Um, but it's gone on, it's had, it has a recording, it's gone on to have a regional life. Um, but yeah, and it, it's so funny now, There's they turn so many movies into musicals now. And back then it was with Warner Brothers and no one, it was, no one was really doing this. I think I called back in 1996 or 1997 and I called, literally called Warner Brothers and I'm like, I'd like to, uh, I'm interested in one of your titles and making it into a musical. And they didn't even have a music musical division at the, that time. And they, they, I, they transferred me about seven times around <laughs> Warner Brothers. And finally someone said, what is this? And you want to do what with it? And I said, I'm making a musical out of it. And I was so naive at the time. And they just literally like gave it to me. <laughs> I mean, now it's, it's unheard of because, you know, every title has been t is, is wrapped up and some, someone's got the rights to every title. But back then they didn't. Spider-Man, oh, oh every famous everything. case. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so was there other in, uh, issues in interpreting a film to musicals, something weird, or like wh what were the, some of the challenges with doing that? Well, we got hooked up with the, the original screen, Herman Rauscher, who was the original screenwriter, and uh, it, it's, it's funny, I've run, this has happened so many times. It's, it's based on a book, but that's not the case. He wrote the screenplay, and then Warner Brothers said, It'll sell more if you if you write the book. So he went then he went back and wrote it as a book, and then Warner Brothers sold it as uh, the screenplay based off the book, even though the screenplay was written first. But it's happened many many times that way. And uh, yeah, I sort of not. And it was an it was semi autobiographical. So he had had this. Uh, it was about him as a boy and him befriending this uh, young war bride, and um, so he working with him and sort of making sure that he was. I was honoring his story. And so that, to me, was the biggest challenge. You know, he, he, he gave us a lot of um, uh, leeway into developing it the way we wanted to, but I still wanted to make sure that I was honoring the original intent of, of his story and because it was personal to him. And uh, I remember, the, never forget, we did the first run-through for him. We did the Goodspeed Opera House uh, in Connecticut, and we did the first run-through with him, and he just was, broke down in tears. And I was just like, you know, then I'm like, okay, we're, we're doing something right. That's, that's gotta be the best feeling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell an anecdote, because I think this fits well here. Um, uh, for some of you know that I, I got married uh, two weeks ago, and so, um, and I was getting uh, my hair cut, trying to get ready for the wedding, and I got it cut early enough that if it went wrong, it would be okay. Uh, but the hairdresser there, this is at the guy's place, for those of you that know where that is, um, and uh, was talking about her, I was telling her about the conference, and I was telling, this was before we had confirmed you, and it, like literally the two days before, and she was telling me about her daughter at the Marquette High School, I believe, they really wanted to put Clue on. And they're like, I don't know, and they're having like, you know, was worried about the cost of it and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, you know, could you come? Like, we'll have some really great things on theater. Like, should bring it. It's like, oh, okay. And then I literally like started doing research on you, and it was like, oh, and code co-wrote Clue in the in the. And I was like, well, man, that would have been a great connection if, if they yeah. if they'd, they'd they'd had that. So. Yeah, we developed. I helped develop. So Clue, the movie Clue, we. Um, about three years ago, I helped develop the stage production and co-wrote the stage production, which now is the number one uh, show that's being produced in high school last year. Last year, and in fact, I just got a bottle of champagne. It was sent to my apart apartment. Oh wow! Congratulating for like the yeah. I guess we were we were the most produced show, which is I'm not seeing any money from it, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, but because uh, it's you know it's a film and is the it's the it it's. There's a lot of other money goes somewhere else, but um, still, that was a. Uh, I, it's great to see it getting done. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's one of my favorites from the '80s. Yeah, I, I didn't understand half the jokes at the time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll kind of go into a little bit more of your acting career before we jump into some of the more writing and directing. Uh, so let's talk about uh, you were nominated for a Tony playing Seymour in Little Shop of Horrors, and. What was that like? Was it a surreal? Like, how, 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 what's it like to get nominated for one of those, what, 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 what's it, the, the, the what Tony, Oscar? EGOT. EGOTs, that's yeah. the word I was looking for. What's it like to be a T in the EGOT? Um, you know, it's sort of sur surreal. I got to perf 
for Urinetown, I got to perform on the Tonys, which is much, um, yeah, that, that's the scariest thing I've ever done, because you're performing in, on, in front of a live, you know, Radio City Music Hall in front of, uh, I mean, not that it's not, I don't know how many people watch the Tonys, but still, it's a large audience, and that, that to me was really, really frightening. And that, so the Tony, being nominated for Tony really wasn't that, um, I mean, it was exciting, but it, w it wasn't as nerve-wracking as, because I, I was against Hugh Jackman, so I'm like, okay. Ooh, uh, yeah, so, yeah. You know, I, I, if, I think if I had gone into it being like, well, I got a chance to win, you know, Hugh Jackman was, not only was he hosting the Tonys, <laughs> I mean, he was going to get it, and we all <laughs> knew it. So it, there was really kind of, I was very relaxed about the whole thing and just kind of had a good time. Um, I didn't have to prepare, you know, prepare a speech or anything, or because I knew that I wasn't going to win, but... Um, it's a very, it's a very very exciting time. I'll, I'll never forget we we did a um, we had like a you have, you have all these Tony um, things you have to do and it happens really really fast. So you get a nomination and then all of a sudden it's got to, you got to go to this luncheon and this and this and this and this, and this which all leads up to the telecast. And uh, that year Wicked had been nominated, so uh, the luncheon you know Adina was Menzel was there and um, Kristen Chenoweth and uh, Audrey McDonald, a lot of theater stars. So it was great to sort of have this. You know, um, I don't know, it, and I'll never, I'll never forget. You know, the, the, when the I forget who it was who sort of addressed us at the luncheon and said, "You know, you you guys are will always be a Tony nominee, always, and that'll always sort of be." And I always think about that. I'm like, "There's nothing that can ever take away." You know, it's, it's not Tony loser to Hugh Jackman; it's Tony nominee. So I think it's very special. And just before we move on to go back to Summer '42, um, uh, Adina Menzel was when we did it for the first time, Adina Menzel was the lead in Summer 42. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, yeah. and then we fired her when we, when we moved <laughs> off front. Oops. <laughs> no, uh, I'm, I know it's true. Yeah. So Adina Menzel was, 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 did our show at good speed, and then uh, we, had, we did it off-Broadway in New York, and uh, we didn't give it to Adina, and I kept, I fought from like, this is Adina Menzel, we gotta keep, and they're like, no, 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 we should go to this other person. So I'm like, we fired Adina Menzel. That's a, that's a badge too, right? Uh, yeah, in a way. Uh, but as, as far as Hugh Jackman's concerned, I, we have uh, the editor at Deadpool later today, so I think he might know a guy who could, wants to fight Hugh Jackman or do something with Hugh Jackman. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, my sister's actually doing uh, Music Man right now with Hugh Jackman. Oh, wow. Yeah. On Broadway. So. That's got to be a, 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 a hoot. Yeah. Uh, he's a really nice guy, by the he, way. He, he's always, everything I've heard has been that yeah. he's great. He's a really good guy. Um, so, uh, speaking on, on writing and co-writing, um, you adapted uh, Bonnie and Clyde at a residency, it looked like. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and uh, what drew you to that story? And I'm just curious, because, you know, I've, this is a collaboration conference, so wh what's it like there? And were there any weird parallels with, like, collaborating with a partner and the idea of whole, like, Bonnie and Clyde? Oh, um, <laughs> well, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, we... There was a Broadway version of Bonnie and Clyde, and we were developing another Bonnie and Clyde, and so we were both sort of happening at the same time, which was not great because theirs went to Broadway, which sort of ended our our, uh, our trajectory, unfortunately. Um, no, it was it was you know collaboration is always the, the Rick Crom was the uh, my collaborator on that, and he wrote the music and the lyrics, and uh, we actually our collaboration was pretty pretty good. Not, not all collaborations go well. My collaboration on Summer 42 was very difficult, and uh, we ended up not working, ever working together again. Um, on Bonnie and Clyde, though, we actually got along pretty well, and we w I would work together again. It's collaboration is a, speaking of, it's just, it's, it's, the, it's like a marriage, you know, and, and you, have to, you have to figure out how you click together and how you work together, and you have to trust the other person, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm sure that as crazy as the real Bonnie and Clyde were, I'm sure they, they something made them click together. I don't know, but um, yeah, collaboration it can be can be tricky, and you have to find the right person, just like you're trying to find a, a right partner in life, you know. Um, and they don't always work, and in some of the greatest collaborations that you can think of, um, you know, I, I think I remember reading one time Stephen Sondheim said didn't want Hal Prince to direct Company. Uh, or one, I can't remember, maybe, no, maybe it was, uh, uh, either, it was either Follies or it was a Little Night Music, um, because he didn't think, Stephen Sondheim, and, you know, they had a great collaboration, said he doesn't think Hal can direct. <laughs> yeah, and it's, which is interesting to think about, it. you know, these two titans, Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim, and, 
and, and Stephen Sondheim was, they, you know, and they eventually just quit working together as well. Um, but they, the success that they had was, was enormous. But anyway, a collaboration is a tricky, tricky thing. Yeah, I think you all, we all want to have that person we're willing to sit in our bullet real hold car, car with when it comes to creativity. Absolutely, because yeah. you really have to have each other's back and you can't be rogue and you can't be thinking about yourself. You have to be thinking about what's best for the piece. And it's not, it's not about who's gonna come out of this I mean, that's, I think that's with, um, in collaboration with anything, and I tell my cast when I'm directing my cast, I'm like, you know, this isn't about one individual person, this is about all of us collectively, um, and how do we, and, and it's about the show. And one thing that I always tell them is, you know, you have to make the other person more important than yourself. And if we all make the other person more important than yourself, then we all succeed as a team. Um. So, and, and, and to, to kind of maybe take it to a, 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 like an interesting note, uh, one of the things I found in your, in your bio was in 2008, you wrote for a TV show called Rosie Live with Rosie O'Donnell, and it was canceled after the first episode. Yeah. What kind of experience is like that, and what's it feel like to have something that you've put so much blood, sweat, and tears in not come to fruition? Well, I don't know if you guys remember Rosie Live. Um, <laughs> it, Rosie Live was, was, it had great intentions. Um, I had known Rosie O'Donnell. Um, we did Grease together on Broadway back, that opened in 1994. And so we remained friends with Rosie for a long time. And uh, Rosie can be very, very, she can be very loyal. She can be one of the, um, do a lot of things for her friends, but she can also just be a pain in the ass. <laughs> and that's just the, that's just who she is. I mean, you know, uh, you you guys know that, and um, you know, it, and uh, and and just know that how, how the little tangent, just how stars feel things. You know, there was a long-standing feud between Rosie O'Donnell and, uh, and Donald Trump, and Trump said something about her on one of the debates. And uh, my wife, who knows Rosie more than I do, texted Rosie, and Rosie was said, "I'm in." T Rosie was devastated. You know, so it's just it's so interesting how we don't we, we don't think of stars and how they and and and. You know, Rosie was, after he had said something, I called her or whatever, and, and she said she, she couldn't get out of bed for a few days. So it's, it's really, you know, it's something to think about, 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 about stars. Anyway, but she, but she, uh, we, she asked, knew that I wrote this, some comedy stuff um, from, uh, that my wife was involved in, and so they, there was a sketch on the show that I wrote uh, along with the other writers. And, you know, I think the first inclination was this sketch was gonna be a reoccurring sketch and it was gonna be on every you know, episode. And NBC was producing it, it was, it was live. Uh, we did it in a theater, an off-Broadway theater. It was a disaster, <laughs> the ratings were horrible, and uh, they canceled it. But I think that's the thing is you, you, you have these, you know, you get these big things and you, you sort of, you think 10 steps ahead, you know. Um, my wife was the, uh, was the voice of you know, Princess and the Frog, the Disney cartoon, Princess and the Frog. My wife was the voice of Charlotte, who was uh, Tiana's best friend and, and Princess and the Frog. And I'll never forget when she got, the, she got it, and you're like, oh my God, she's, playing a, she's the voice of a Disney princess. We are going to be millionaires. <laughs> you know, that's the thing, you know what I mean? You just, you go there and you think about it, and then, of course, you know, Princess and the Frog doesn't do very well. Up is the big cartoon of the, of the year, and so, um, you know, that's just the way, it, it's the way it goes. And the same thing with Rosie Live. I think we thought it, this could be a huge thing. This could, you know, it could be running for years and we could be writing and, and, and it just didn't happen. And that's the way it is. And that's what, that's what you have to, as in this business, it's always going to be disappointment. And it's how you manage the that's, disappointment, yeah. right? And I don't, and the thing is, I don't get disappointed anymore. Oh. I just go, that's just the way it is. And then when I was younger, I was like, okay, oh, why didn't I get this? You know, I wanted to be in Rent so bad. I, I auditioned for Rent. 10 times, I was like, my dream was to be in Rent on Broadway, and I never got cast. And it was just devastated me, because I was so young, and now I'm just like, eh. So, I, mean, I mean, I love Rent, but, but now it's, you know, it's, there are other things, you know, you could be, there's so, there other shows. Yeah, there, there, there's no pinnacle, it's always like, wherever, what, whatever you can do, do the best you can with it, right? Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've performed in 11 Broadway shows, I probably auditioned for 70. You know, so, or how many things have I auditioned for total in my life? 500, you know, to, you know, so it's the percentage of success out of all that is small. You know? So, so pretty good from what I've heard. And well, no, no, but, it, <laughs> no, but it's not, but it's like, it's like baseball. Go back to baseball. You hit a good, a good baseball player hits three out of 10 times. So you're not going to get everything that you audition for. You're not everything that you're in is a success. I and mean, the last three shows I did on Broadway were all, all closed quickly. Hmm. 
Um, so, so that kind of is a good uh, segue to the next question. Uh, you see, you've done quite a bit of Broadway, but you've also done uh, regional theater. And like, what, what do you love about uh, the differences between those two, and what do you hate? Like, what, 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 what's the, the ratio and how it works? Um, what I love about regional theater is that it's, it's more about the work. You know, it's more about uh, taking chances. It's more about uh, the artistry of what we're trying to do, because especially if, you're, if, you're, if it's a theater that has a subscription base, you know, it may not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a hit to succeed. And it's also, there's a finite number of weeks. So we're gonna do, we're gonna work, do this for five weeks, for four weeks total. On Broadway, there's so much um, pressure um, for a show to succeed in order to run. And, you know, you, for example, like I did a, a, a musical called Bridges of Madison County based on the movie. We all thought that it was a popular title, that it was gonna, you know, have some, it was going to run, and so you sort of plan your life, thinking, "Oh, this show's going to run for six months," or blah, blah. and so it ended up maybe running six weeks, and so that's that is that's tough to manage because then you have to sort of scramble and say, "Okay, well, now what am I going to do?" Because I sort of planned on this running for six months or eight months or a year, and now I have to kind of rescramble your life. And there's so much pressure to it, and then we we knew that we were we weren't doing well with bridges, and so there was this. Um, anxiety about when, when are we going to get the, the, the text message that the producers want to meet you at 6 on a Tuesday. And that's usually, that's always the, um, you know what that is. Yeah. If the producers want to meet you at 6 o'clock on a Tuesday, Tuesday is usually the start of the week and Sunday is the end of the week, that means that they're going to announce the closing and, for, and that and they'll, they're going to close on Sunday. And, that's, that's, and sure enough, that day on Tuesday, I got a text message from my stage manager cast company meeting at six o'clock, and they're like, okay, here we go. And of course, that's the truth. So, but um, regional theater just is more, it's just, you don't, you don't have to worry so much about, because it's, you already have a run, you know what it is. And, and I love, I love communi communities. You know, Broadway is about tourists, it's about, I mean, there is a, there is a, um, a lot of New Yorkers who do, do come, but it's about a, a lot of other things. It's about commerce, it's about, you know, you have to run Broadway shows at 70% capacity in order for them. You don't necessarily have to do that regionally. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I love, I, I love, um, I love working regionally. I love traveling. I love seeing the part of the country. Um, you know, even coming up, I've, I've been to UP when I was probably about 30 years ago. Um, but it's great to come, come back to Marquette, you know, cause I, we, I played Marquette in a very, a small van production of Evita <laughs> a long and, time ago. And now Elf will be at, uh, Forrest Roberts. Yes. Yes. Um, that's right. The, um, yeah, yeah I think that's. That, that, that sounds like, yeah, you always got that pressure, that high pressure. I'm guessing the, the, uh, the, the talk on the Tuesday is the uh, nine to five of like getting fired on a Friday afternoon kind yes, of scenario. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. But then there's, you know, the, um, the equivalent of that, of the, the pressure of the new Broadway show versus the um, long running Broadway show. So like, for example, um, I was in Les Mis and that's sort of like a nine to five job or was, I mean, it's closed now. But at the time, Les Mis wasn't going anywhere. And so you sort of plopped into to Les Mis and you would do the show, and but you, you knew it wasn't going anywhere, and that was sort of your job, and uh, that, there was something kind of very comfortable about that. Um, I have a friend of mine who's gone in Chicago. He had he had a kid, and he went in Chicago, and Chicago's now been running for I don't know 20, 30 years, and and you know he's been in Chicago for four years, and you know it's the same show. You're doing eight shows a week, um, but there's something comfortable about that. You're, you're and Chicago's not going anywhere. I mean, who knows? Post pandemic, anything could happen, but. So there is, it's the, the new shows are the ones that are, you don't know what's gonna happen and there's a lot of pressure when they open. Okay, so we'll, we'll kind of uh, move, move to television now here. So I'm a huge fan of Bunheads. I got into it from uh, Gilmore Girls, of course, and um, it actually helped me like discover your sister and some of those things. So what was it like to play opposite of your sister who was the, uh, the star of, of Bunheads? And uh, and work with Amy Sherman Pal Palladino. Um, you know, I I hadn't really pursued film and TV. I've done a, a few things here and there, and then um, you know, uh, my sister. I think a they were looking for someone to play my sister's brother on Bunheads, and so I think Amy Sherman Palladino, who who's a huge theater fan by the way, she loves the theater, and she was like, "You should get Hunter to play your brother." And I was like, and then and so they, I got a phone call and. I was like, well, absolutely, that'd be a blast. And so, um, yeah, I went out to LA and stay with, live with my sister, and then, and we sort of did, 
you know, a few episodes together. I actually played her brother in real life, sort of her deadbeat brother. Um, and I got to work with Amy and, and Dan, her husband. And uh, they were just, uh, and it, it's all sorts of stories about Amy Sherman Palladino, but she's the, uh, she's the nicest, loveliest woman. I mean, she's and she's so talented. Her and Dan are so talented. And uh, they treated me like, I mean, they were they were really really great to, to me, and it was it was it was such a fun experience to like do that with my sister on that show. And I was and you know the, the, they talk about you know because they they were like oh we want you to continue on, and of course it gets canceled. So there it goes back to the same thing. It's like you think oh wow I'm gonna be a recur I'm gonna be a reoccurring char character on this TV show, and then they then they canceled it. Uh, that was a big travesty. I really liked that show, and I never thought I'd like a show about ballet. That was never was, something, and it was, but it I mean, obviously, like with any of their works, it's about way more than just the, yeah, the the, the one sentence one sentence pitch. Yeah, she and she's such a, Amy's a really really good writer, really good writer for TV. Yes, um, I'm, I'm a fan. Yeah. Um, so uh, you're, you until fairly recently, pandemic, you were the artistic director of, of Red House. And I, what's it like being like a director of a whole theater rather than having just like one show under uh, that you're in, in charge of? Yes. Yeah, so I had always wanted to be um, an artistic director. Um, if you guys don't know, artistic directors basically are, are the artistic uh, visionary of the theater. So they usually they usually have a managing director who handles the business side, and the artistic director usually handles all, you know the planning of the shows and the hiring of the actors, the hiring designers and writers, and and everything that sort of goes and sort of plans the artistic vision of the. Uh, of the theater, so I'd, I'd always wanted to be a, an artistic director, and um, you know, I, I I directed, I performed for till about 2014, and then I started being a director full time, um, transitioned into becoming a director, and then in 2018, I I, I got hired to be an artistic director uh, for a theater in Syracuse called um, uh, uh, Red House, the Red House Art Center, um, and it was, uh, it, it, you know, it's it's that's a whole new thing. Because you're, you feel you're, you're a producer basically because you're producing musicals and plays and and um, there's, so there's an added pressure to that as well. You're, you're trying to you're, and you're trying to take care of your staff and you're trying to do things within budget and that was all new to me. So it was it was uh, and then to throw after all those challenges, uh, a pandemic happened. So. It, you know, I'll never forget we were uh, in rehearsals. We were doing Fences, the August Wilson play, and we had finished our first week of rehearsal. And Ted Lange from Love Boat was our director. If you remember Isaac from Love Boat, if anybody's old enough to remember, he was our director. And, and then we had to have a meeting because the things were, start, things were starting to go haywire. You know, the NBA was canceled, and, uh, and so th Broadway was being canceled. And, so, and you know that the, the responsibility of all of that, and at the time I'll never forget it was like March, right in March 14th maybe, and New York was about ready to shut everything down, and there was rumors that they were actually going to quarantine New York City, and they were going to shut all air travel down. So there was, I'll never forget that. I was like, okay. So I got my wife out of the city and brought her up to Syracuse because I'm like, they're going to shut New York City down. They're not going to let anybody out, and then they thought the air, air travel was going to be shut down, so we had to stop production and get everyone on planes and get them out to ho their homes. And that was an enormous amount of uh, responsibility because I wanted to take, make sure everyone was okay. And then going forward with that, having to make decisions based on all the things about the pandemic. Um, so that was a lot of, that's, that, that was a, a lot, you know, it was a lot of work and ultimately I, they, the pandemic, they had to terminate the job, my, my position, because they couldn't afford it. Um, and now, you know, the good thing is that a lot of these theaters are coming back, which is, which is terrific. But, you know, the, the good thing about being an artistic director was also taking care of people. I've, I wanted to take care of people. I wanted to do things that mattered. We did a New Works Festival in which we found these, these really great new plays, and we put them on, and uh, some from, from writers who had submitted their work. And that, to me, was my, my, what I loved the most. And we would do these readings, these free readings for audiences, and we would have these dis the, the, Q and A's afterwards, talking about the play, and and that to me was the most uh, most incredible part about about it all. Um, and also because I was I was trying to create a new a new kind of theater. We had a, a large black box theater. Um, if you don't know what a black box is, there's no proscenium whatsoever. You can do any configuration you want. And so the first show um, I decided to do um, was of course Rent, 
because I never got to be in it. So I decided I was gonna direct it, <laughs> produce it. And so we did Rent, and we did it in the round. And if you don't know what the round is, it's round is kind of like this. It would be seating on all four sides. And it was very immersive, and I'm big into immersive theater, and I just, I just uh, like we literally had actors sitting at t in the seats next to the people. And to me, that was, I was so proud of that production because, uh, uh, you know, just because you, you could be right in the audience's face. Of course, you can't, now you can't do that at all anymore, but um, hopefully it, it, we can be, we'll get to a place where we can do it again, because I was big in immersive theater and was really hoping to do more of that. I wanted the, the experience to be, and also, my, my big thing about being an artistic director is sort of like what this is. You know, it, it, the, exper the, the, the experience of going to theater isn't just, I buy my ticket, I go, I sit down, I watch, I go home. But there, there are, we would do discussions before the, about the play before the performances. We would do talkbacks afterwards. We would, um, I wanted it to feel like it was uh, an evening of learning about, you know, how, how Rent came to be, or we did God of Carnage, uh, you know, lear learning about, that play and what that play meant. Uh, Fences was the same way we would have done if it, it, it hadn't canceled. So we, uh, Fun Home was a musical we were gonna do. You know, those were, they were all going to be experiences because I feel like, you know, you, 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 you want it to be something like this where you, you, you come away with something, you learn something, you get to, and a lot of people don't understand what it takes to be, what, what it takes to put on a show. Like, people are amazed sometimes about the, all the planning it takes to put on a show, the rehearsal process, the, uh, the casting process, all the people that, that work backstage, the tech process, which uh, a lot of people had no idea when we would take people backstage and, or, and watch the, the technical rehearsals and what, what it takes, the lights, sound, scenic, everything to, to actually make a show. It looks easy once it's put, put up there, but, you know, on Broadway, we tech for two weeks. And then we were uh, usually Broadway shows tech for two weeks, and they um, they they put, go into previews for four weeks. So it's like a six week process. You know, if you're doing a show at Red House, you have two days of tech and one preview. So I mean, and, same, and that's so that regional theater is a much shorter tech process. But I I just I wanted people to learn about theater and what. And so I think that that was that was a one reason why I really, and I also. Community outreach. We were really doing a lot of things about reaching out to the community, especially a town like Syracuse, which is a, a blue-collar, sort of low economic area. And um, one thing that we did was um, um, we, we raised money to buy tickets. So people would donate money, and then we bought a bunch of tickets, and we gave those tickets out to um, uh, AIDS organizations um, in, the, in the area. Uh, drug rehabilitation centers, any, any, uh, to people who couldn't afford to come to the theater, who didn't think they were welcome to the theater. We, I really wanted to make sure that they, um, if, if you couldn't, I don't, I don't want to hear, I can't afford to buy a ticket. Well, if you can't afford to buy a ticket, here's, we, we want to make sure you can see it. Because then, you know, it, it's, theater should be for everyone. It shouldn't just be for the privileged. It shouldn't be for just the, um, the people who can afford it. It should be for everyone. And so I think that, you know, and that's, that's how you inspire people to either, because that's what inspired me. That's what made me want to be in the theater, an opportunity. I didn't know what it was. And when I, when I finally saw what it was, I'm like, oh, I can do that. And so that's something we really wanted to do. And that's where we, we were heading before the pandemic sort of upended us. So yeah. that's great, great. Yeah. I, I'm 100% a believer in like in the arts for anyone. Absolutely. Yeah. It can't, shouldn't be just for, you know, and, and, and Broadway, that's the problem with Broadway is that, you know, tickets for Hamilton are 400 bucks. Yeah, still haven't seen it. Um, I mean, I guess you do. You can do. You can do the the rush, but still. Yeah. So uh, that, that just kind of came up with a question, and one of the things that I've been like, I have a I do a lot of research. Uh, one of my passions is nonlinear storytelling, yeah. and uh, I know that I've been seeing. There's you were talking about immersion. Have you looked into those more like immersive theatrical productions where it's like you're moving through a space? I saw a great one in Brooklyn uh, not too long ago. I'm doing Alice in Wonderland in an in a old insane in, or old asylum and like how that experience was. I've wondered if you ever looked into that kind of stuff? Yeah, we have. I mean, we were th even thinking about that in Syracuse, you know, um, uh, so speaking of Hands and Hard Body, I don't know if you know, Hands and Hard Body was a documentary about uh, a bunch of people who put their hands on a truck and then the last person who goes on for days and then the last person who can keep their hand on the truck wins the truck. And so they made a, it was a documentary that, that came out by about 20 years ago, and they made a musical out of it, and I was in the musical. Um, it didn't last very long, we, can't, we closed pretty quickly, but um, you know, so 
uh, one of my ideas was actually going having, when, especially when the pandemic forces you to sort of think outside the box. Okay, what are we gonna, like I wanted to do damn Yankees at a baseball stadium. So I was like, we should do damn Yankees at a baseball, and everyone's like, oh my God, that's a great idea. And we, we couldn't do it because we couldn't get the stadium. But, uh, but the other one was to do uh, Hands in a Hard Body at an actual dealership. Ooh. So then you would put risers around, and, and so, you know, which I thought would have been a great idea. Of course, the, the, none of the dealerships wanted... They probably looked at you like you grew a third eye. <laughs> well, we, well, we didn't really pursue as, as much as we wanted. And then, of course, the pandemic happened, and I, my, I didn't stay. But that was an idea. Like, t is there a way to take these, play, you know, these show? Like, you could do Chicago at an old, at an old prison. You know, is there... I, I love immersive experiences. There was... Um, uh, um, Trying to, was it Boys in the Band or was it Normal? I can't remember which one was was set in an, an apartment in the city. So then you walked into the apartment and there was seating all around the apartment and the, and you know the actors moved and went to the kitchen, went to the living room and and you were just a uh, you were an actor you were an audience in the, an actual apartment space, which I think is just that, to me that's fascinating. Yeah, and the fact that you could have an entirely different experience each night you went as a as a viewer or even as a as a, as a cast member right it's and great re you know the, I, I one thing i've learned a little bit about is the art side and i've learned a little bit more about the business side of that so when you you know cuz you have to obviously create revenue and so when we were doing rent i kept people would sit on one side and they said oh god i missed what was happening on the other side and i said you could buy another ticket <laughs> <laughs> well but then, no, but then i thought well okay well here's a way to if you if you if you've already seen the Rent, maybe you buy another ticket and you get 20% off or something. You know, you think about stuff like that. But yeah, you create other ways to, for revenue streams to people to come back and see, see shows from a different angle, from a different room. Well, we're running down, running down to the last few minutes here. So we think we have time for a couple of questions. So is there anyone that has questions in the audience? Uh, you were talking about immersive theater experiences and also the pandemic. Uh, over the course of the pandemic and like the lockdown period, did you? experiment with any streaming or like, let's say like 3D camera work or things like that, like any kind of streaming theater? Oh yeah, oh absolutely. I mean, we were, the so we did a show called um, uh, Dramatist Play Service, which is one of the publishing houses reached out to me and said, uh, we have a new play called, um, it, at the time it was called Streaming Passion and I, I was like, what is stream, stream passion? <laughs> and it, but it was, and so I, I talked to the playwright and it was about um, these people that were getting together on Zoom during the pandemic to uh, do the passion play. And the first thing I said is you have to change the title. I said, because <laughs> streaming passion sounds like not a, not a, a good website to go to. So, uh, <laughs> and so we came up, I came up with the, I, I said, why don't you call it waiting for the host? Which obviously is something we all see on Zoom and it has the host is obviously something that, that would be a part of um, uh, Easter. Uh, so we changed the title and then we did a reading of it and we actually, um, it was the world premiere of this play. And we did it on, and I, they, at the time I knew nothing about Zoom. I, and so the creation of it was very, very clumsy. And so then I, it, get, it was really, get to be really popular and we did this in June of 2020. And so then I wrote the play right again. I, I'm like, uh, you should write a sequel. And he's like, okay. So he wrote a sequel in like a, like a week. And then we went back in rehearsals and did it again. And now it's act two. And, you can, and they published it. And so if you, it's called Waiting for the Host. It's by Mark, Mark Palmieri. And it actually says developed and you know, world premiere at the Red House Art Center, Hunter Foster Artistic Director. So I'm like, that's, you know, we have like a published script and we did that during the pandemic with this new play and we did it on the Zoom platform. And the whole concept was that it was all these, this, pre, this pastor of, um, uh, of, the, of his church was having a Zoom call with all these actors and they were trying to produce the passion play on, online. And it's a really funny, funny play, and we developed it. So we actually developed a brand new play during the pandemic, um, and then we did. Um, uh, it, it, we decided to do a Christmas. We, felt we, we <laughs> Syracuse was not sort of um, in the when the pandemic first happened. We were sort of it was very, very light. Cases were very, very light, and so um, we decided we were going to do an in-person "It's a Wonderful Life" in December of 2020. Then. Syracuse students came back at Syracuse University, and then of course our numbers went crazy. So they, um, our Onondaga County, which is the county Syracuse is in, was completely shut down. So then we couldn't do the play. 
And so we moved the production to the next county <laughs> because <laughs> they were open. And so, um, and then we taped it. So we were able to tape. We went to another theater. We literally just like picked up everything and went to another theater and, 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 and taped it. And what we did, I had a really great um, visual guy and we had, it was a three camera shoot and we called, um, we, we did it live to tape. So we, t we, did, every, we did it live because we didn't want to just shoot segments. We wanted to do it as if we were doing it straight from beginning to end. We shot it twice from three different camera angles. And uh, it, it, was, it was, to this day, it was, and we did it a year ago right, right now, like in November. And it was just, it was so much fun to do that because we, we were coming up with all the different camera angles and how we were going to shoot it. And then like when George goes back, you know, he says, I don't want to be born. We went to black and white, like what you call these really artist, cool artistic liberties. And um, yeah, it was, and it was the first time that the actors, I'd been around actors together and we all took our masks off in the theater. And that was really, because we had been in, only around each other in masks. And that was, I'll never forget that. It almost went, I almost started crying because, and I kept them all six feet apart um, on stage. And, uh, and it's the radio play, if you don't know. So they were just doing it as if we're doing It's Wonderful Life as a radio play. And I'll never forget that everyone taking their masks off. And it was just, it was such an emotional experience. experience. I, I think it still is right now. Um, yeah. yeah um, I, and I, I know it's a very important skill as for, for actors to be able to be able to turn black and white by on their own. I think that's a very important skill. Yes, they turn black and white on so, their own. Yeah, did, so, yeah. 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 Um, I think we probably have time for one more quick question. I have this intense curiosity as to where creativity and talent comes from. And now you talk about your sister, obviously you've got a lot of talent in that family of yours. And I know you're supposedly supposed to get your intelligence from your mothers. Now, I know just like, what about you? What about your family? Where do you think that came from? You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I grew up in Georgia a very sort of southern, conservative southern family um, that was not artistic in any way. Um, there was nothing, I didn't grow up with musicals or plays or theater, I knew nothing about it. Um, you know, it didn't, it, it was not something instilled by my parents. Uh, so I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't know. So it was not, it was not influenced at home. Um, but I was always creative. I was always like, even as a young kid, um, I remember I was in third grade, I think, and I decided to write a play, and it was um, about Dracula, and uh, it was four pages long, front and back, and um, I told my teacher, I said, I want to I rehearse this. I knew nothing about theater, and I said, I want to rehearse this, and she said, okay, and she helped me, and so we rehearsed every day after school, and then we did a performance. Um, all I remember is I played Dracula, and I was in the show itself. I don't know where that, I, to this day, I don't know where it came from. I don't know, I don't know if it's in, innate or I have, I have no idea because it was not something that um, my parents taught me or something I was around. I wasn't around friends who were that way. It just was something, um, and I was always, you know, writing and doing, I mean, I was never a drawer or anything like that. My, my, my sister was always the drawer, so I was always the writer and she was always sort of like drawing. So, but my parents were always like, I don't know where, I don't know where that came from. But your sister was also like that, right? Yeah. I mean, she had that innate abilities to be creative and yeah, talent. And it, the talent was there. And so it's like a systemic thing. I mean, there's the nature nurture idea, but you, you had to start with something there. I always think that people, like, like I'm, I'm musical to a point, but then when I see these young kids who are just so, have the ability, the, the, the music is so in them, and I'm like, where does that come from? Like, you see these six-year-olds, like, playing, you know, Beethoven and, and, or, or, you know, being able to play the violin and cello and all those things, and, and I don't, that, that comes from something, and I don't know, I don't know what it is. Well, I'm sure there is research out there. I've got to pick it up. Yeah, because there's, it's, it, it, I don't know, I don't know, because I always, I always felt like I, I always had stories I wanted to tell. It was always about story for me. Everything I, I've done in life is about telling a story, whether it's. Um, Acting, directing, writing, it's all about telling a story. And I say that to um, my students, I say that to my uh, actors. I'm like, we, we have to tell, ultimately what we're doing is telling a story, no matter what you're doing. And I was always a storyteller, even when I was a kid. So, and, and again, I don't know where that, that came from. And, that, and I wanted to tell stories my whole life. Um, one thing that I think a lot, and I think this is a reflection on your teacher letting you do that, it's like that responsible permissiveness saying, yes, you can do that, 
as long as you follow through, right? I think yeah. that, and you know, I know my parents were the same way. They were not very, you know, super creative, though eventually my, but the fact that they're willing to let you and willing to do that. You said your parents freaked out when you went full time into it. Well, they let you get to a point. Right. Like, you know, they, you know that's another thing. It's like, oh, well, that's fun. He, he's got a thing. Oh, he's got a thing and he's going to rehearsal and that's, isn't that great? And then you come home one day and you're like, no, I think I want to do this for a living. And you, you get blank stares. And they're yep. like, oh, no, no, you're going to work in an office and you're going to blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't, I don't think so. I think I'm going to do this for a living. And they look at you like, you know, and, and, you know, my mother, I remember I packed up, I was living in Detroit, and I packed up my car, and I was going to, I drove this 1977 Monte Carlo from Detroit to Manhattan, and uh, I'll never forget, my mother said, don't do this, mm. you know, because she was scared. I mean, she was nervous. She was afraid I was, I was moving to New York City, even though I was from, I'm like, we've been living in, De I mean, well, not in Detroit, but outside Detroit. I said, you know, that was a more dangerous city than New York City, but um, still, she was like, don't do this. And I was like, uh, I, I, but I knew there was something I knew I had to. I knew I had to. And even when the, any I've had challenges in my life, anytime that, it's, that the door's closed, there's something that's always, there's been a passion to keep going no matter what. And um, I've never wanted, I've never allowed myself to, and I never will. Even the pandemic is not, I'm like, I'm not going to give up doing what I love to do. We have one, we're time for one more, or are we good? So what is the one thing that you've learned from working with amateurs or aspiring uh, artists in, in, in any of your multi-facets? Working with amateurs? Um, amateurs or aspiring artists? Yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, I'm working with um, the students over at Northern Michigan right now, um, and I always find that to be, you know, professionals are a, a completely different animal, and but then working with... I love the fearless, sometimes the fearlessness, I think, that comes with, um, like they, especially working with students, you know, they, they just have a, they, just, they have a love for it in a way that I think that um, it becomes more of a, I'm not saying you don't lose passion when you go forward, and, as, but, you know, when you, when you become a professional, it's about, you know, you still have a, some of us have wives and kids and families and partners and husbands and you know, you're, so there's a, a bit of like, I have to do this to support my family. And there's something when it's, it's amateurs and students where it's just about, that, that none, there's no, none of that sort of put on it. It's just you're doing it because you love to do it. Um, and I sort of, it reminds me of, of why I, it always reminds me of how I started and where I was. So if I ever get jaded or if I ever get, feel like I'm just doing this as a job, it reminds me like, no, you do this because you love to do it. And I'll never forget, I was, a, uh, I, was, I was doing a commercial one time, it's a long time ago, and I couldn't remember the lines. And I just, I just and the, the director was getting frustrated, and you know, everyone was getting frustrated because I was just flubbing the lines, not doing well. And, and I'll just never, this, this young girl came up to me, and she, she took my hand, and she just looked at me in the, right dead in the face and said, you know, you do it because you love it, and that's all that matters. And I, there's, I've always remembered that. And that was, who knows how long ago that was. And I always tell the kids that too. We do this because we love to do it. And that, anytime I work with students, and I, that's what I, I'm reminded of, is that you do it because you love it. You, you go to school because you had a passion for it. And, you, and, you know, it's, and all the other BS that, that comes with it, that doesn't matter. And, it, and awards and Tony Awards and whether the show gets good reviews, that's all junk. You know, but ultimately it's about, you know, doing this thing that you love to do. And it's, I'm, it's, just, it's a privilege and it's, an, you know, I'm blessed to be able to do something that I love to do. And, and, I, and I have to remind myself, and the pandemic really helped me remind myself and working with these kids of that, that I, it's just, it's a, something that you're passionate about, you believe about, that, that it's in your heart and that you get to do it and you should cherish every single moment. And that's, that's one thing that I take away from working with the young, younger kids. All right, I think that will do it. Any, uh, I'd like to thank Hunter Foster for coming out and having this uh, wonderful conversation. Right, thank you so much. And um, So we're gonna take a, a very short break to turn it over and then I believe it is Cal Lane. So, right? Yeah, I got the right, yep, okay. 
I don't have the schedule in front of me. Um, the, um, so thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you.